something, we just want to invite you to come to the altars right now and get prayed over. Our ministry team is here for you, and we have so much love in this house that we just want to extend it to you right now. So 
morning I just want to thank you so much God you have just you sent your son to die for us he laid down his life for us you chase after us with such reckless abandon God I just thank you father God and right now I just give the rest of the service to you as we've committed the beginning I'm committing it all the way to the end because up here on this stage is not me but it is you it is your words it is your heart and Lord I just ask that you just continue to move in this service Oh, we love you and you praise you. In your mighty name we pray, amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. Can we just give it up for this worship team? I mean, these kids are amazing. And these grown folk, I mean, the accordion, what? I will just, real quick, I love music. And you'll see the irony once I get to my message, but... That is not a gift that I possess. Um, whenever you take the, you know, those gift surveys, worship, music, always at the very bottom. I can't sing. Well, I sing. I don't sing well. Um, I teach preschool, and my kids, three and four year olds, are like, "That's enough, Miss Tiffany. You know, read us a book." Like it is not. It is not a skill that I have. I've played two instruments in my entire life. One was the recorder. You guys know, like the plastic clarinet. I don't even know if it looks like a clarinet. Um, in the fourth grade horrible. 
cry through the entire recorder recital because I was like, I'm ruining it for everyone. Like, it is just not good. And then I tried the ukulele. Couldn't do that. Because you have to, like, strum and, like, poke the things. I don't even, like, like it's not, it's not a gift that I have. But I say all that to say I love music. And I feel like God totally has a sense of humor because he's like, I'm going to let you make you so where you're like, worship is your thing, but you're not going to be able to do any of it. So, but, but I love it. I absolutely love it. So, uh, I'll get back to that later. <laughs> um, it is such an honor to be up here on this stage. It is so cool that, you know, you know, Pastor has to leave for me to be up here, you know, because he's like, you know, you know, <laughs> I can do and say things when he's not here. No, just kidding. But, <laughs> um, but it's always such an honor to be up here. I love teaching the kids. It's totally my comfort zone. Like if all of you were like six years old and under your seats, this would totally be easy. But I love it because it pushes me out of my comfort zone and it allows me to have that complete trust in God. That as I'm prepping and as I'm preparing these sermons, I'm like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. And he's like, I know because I don't want you to say anything. I just want you to be my vessel. And he like puts me in check all the time. So as I was saying, let me get back to it. Because the funny thing, the irony in this sermon is that it's all about music. And as I was preparing it, I just had like probably 50 to 100 different things. I was like, God wants me to say this, you know. I feel like, you know, I should go this way or this direction. But almost all of them came from songs. I have music playing all the time. On my way to work, I have the same playlist. I listen to songs on repeat. In my house, Kelly and I, we have like music everywhere. Sometimes there will be music in her room. And then you come out and you go to my room, there's a totally different song playing. There'll be one playing in the kitchen. Like it is just overwhelms my life in such an awesome, great way. So as I was like preparing and prepping, and as a side note, I know that every time I come up here, like I tell you the process of how like God's work came to be, because I need you to know like this has nothing to do with me. Because when I come up here, I wanna make sure that what I'm saying is what he wants you guys to hear, like at this moment, at this time. Because whenever I do kids ministry, I have the amazing honor that I am there like every week, but once a month. So if I do a series or we're doing a certain curriculum and God drops it on my heart, like, no, this Sunday, I want you to talk about honoring your mom and dad. Or this Sunday, I want you to talk about being a witness in your school. It is nothing for me to switch it and do that. And then the next week we just pick up our series. Like we can, it's just real easy. But up here, I get a chance twice a year. So if I am doing what I wanna say because it's easy and comfortable and not what God wants to say, then I don't see this group of people for another six months. And y'all missed it. You missed what God wanted. So the whole process of me coming to be like, oh, let me tell you the struggle this was, was because I want you to know that it is completely me relinquishing everything that is comfortable to my flesh and saying, all right, God, what do you mean to put on these two papers that I may or may not look at because I want you to just tell me, like, this is it. This is what I want my kids to hear this morning. So when I was doing it, I, when I was prepping, this one was like a real struggle. And I feel like every time God just keeps pushing me to my limits. The first couple of times I spoke, God gave me the message and it was like a month in advance. And I ran through that sucker like every morning on my way to work, at home. I mean, Kelly is my cousin. She's also my roommate. And she'd be like, Tiffany, you got it. Like quit. I'm like, no, Kelly, let me tell you one more time. Let me, let me just practice one more time. And even then, if you've heard any of them, I can jam like a three hour sermon in like 15 minutes. I am like, boom, we're going to hit it. Y'all better catch it. Like breathing is not a thing. And so whenever, so when I did that one, you know, when I first started, God gave them to me well in advance and I was able to prep and prepare. Well, back in March or April, I thought I had it. And then the night before God was like, no, I want you to do this instead. And that was like a, Ooh, okay. So, but I typed it all out and I was able to run through it a couple times. But it pushed me a little bit farther because I had to trust him because I didn't have the prep time that I typically did. Well, with this one, like I said, there was so many different things that I was like, this is so good. God, do you want me to say this? Or God, this seems perfect. Let me talk about this. And there were so many different ones that it was up until like last night that God was like, no, this is the one I want you to do. And even then, as I was typing it, he was like, no, I just want you to trust me. And it's like, well, okay, all right, God. Like, you made me, you know who I am. Like, I trust you, 
but can you give me some bullet points and then I'll trust you with the bullet points. You know, like I'm trying to like, you know, kind of be like, okay, God, listen, I'll give a little, but you know, and so with that, God was like, cool, I'll give you some bullet points, but you may not even use them. So, but when I was prepping and when I was praying, there was one point a couple weeks ago and I felt like this was the song I was supposed to do but I didn't really know exactly how. I was at home by myself. I was cleaning, I was worshiping, I was crying because it was just like a horrible day. I mean, you know, sometimes your day's like, you can't pinpoint why it's awful, it just is awful. And so I was crying, I was like, Jesus, I don't know what to do. And like, no one's in my house and I'm just having like my own little pity party. And then this song came on the radio. It's called Story I Tell by Micah Tyler and it's a couple, couple years old. But when I sang it and when I heard it, I was like, wow, that is the coolest song I have heard in such a long time. And I felt in my spirit, this is what you're going to speak on. But then God didn't tell me the rest until last night. But so before I go any further, you need to hear this song. So I have it on a video and I have the words because I need you to fully kind of grasp and understand. And we all have different musical styles, so I hope that you like it too. But um, so we're just going to watch and listen to this song first, and then we'll, I'll keep going. I was the harlot sitting down by the well. I was the leper who was told not to tell. Nobody, 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 nobody even knows my name. Nobody even knows my name Nobody, 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 nobody Nobody, nobody even knows my name
Okay. So I like loved it. So when I heard it and it came on, the thing that I think it just really clicked with me the most is in the course where it says, nobody knows my name. It lists all these great stories and all these great people from the Bible that we only just get this small glimpse of. Like these are essentially the extras of the Bible. You know, like when you are watching a movie, you've got your main characters, you know, and then you have these extras that are needed and are important, but you don't really know anything about them. And so, to, you know, whenever you read the Bible, a lot of times we look at it and we're like, okay, we know about Moses. We know from the time he was born to the time he was died and like almost everything in between. It's very descriptive. There's a lot of details, you know, Abraham and Mary, like these are all what you, when you think of like typical main characters of the Bible, these are the, these people. And then you have this whole group of men and women who just get these small little sections. They don't have books, they don't have chapters. They are just these few verses. And sometimes we gloss over them and sometimes we look past them, but their stories are so impactful and they did something so extraordinary that it made it into the Bible. And not only that, thousands of years later, millions of people later, we are still saying, hey, look at their life. Look what they've done. And I just wanna hit on one in particular. In the very first verse, it says, I was so paralyzed and never have moved until four of my friends who wouldn't give in went and busted up a roof. Now, if you are familiar with scripture, you kind of know who this is talking about, but I wanted to read it. It's in Luke 5, 17 through 26, and it's Jesus forgives and heals a paralyzed man. So verse 17 says, one day Jesus was teaching and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men, came, some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they couldn't find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles in the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. All right, I'm gonna pause right here. These are some legit friends. Like if you do not have friends like this, you need to find some. My two best friends live in North Carolina. They are like six, seven hours away, depending on how fast you drive. And I know for a fact that if I called them today and said, listen, something horrible has happened. I need you right here. They would be in their car and on their way to me. Same with them. If they called me and said, Tiffany, I'm going through something. I need you. I would drop it all and go to them because they are my Luke five type of friends. They, and if you don't have those, I said, look, start looking for them because you need these. We can't do life alone. And sometimes you need some friends. Cause like I said, I teach preschool, got a super active imagination. That's what you got to have to work with these kids. So I am picturing these guys coming. It is hot in the middle East. So they're probably sweating. Their friend was paralyzed, but I'm sure he was still heavy. So they are dragging him. They get to this house and it's full. It is packed. It's maxed out. They can't get in. And so they're looking at, and you know, they're probably a little discouraged. And you know, one of these guys is like, let's just climb. Let's just, let's just go to the top and we'll just like dig and drop them in. And then, you know, there's some of the other friends are probably like, oh, what are you talking about? Like, we can't just dig through their ceiling. But you know, there's that one guy who most likely was like, no, it's fine. It's, fine. it's Jesus. We got to help our buddy. Like, we'll fix it. Like, you know, we know a guy, like it's all good. You know, so, so they, here they are, they're climbing. Now they're trying to get this poor paralyzed friend up on top of the roof. They get up there. Then they're like, cool, we're going to go through this. Like, you know, things are probably dropping on everyone underneath and they're probably digging through, you know, and you probably see one of their heads and everyone's like, what is happening? You know, like just picture the insanity that is probably going on right now. And then they decide, you know what? We're going to lower him down and he's just going to be there with Jesus. Like these friends are the best. Like these are some extraordinary friends. And what's cool is I have no idea who these guys are other than this short little part about them. But I know I want to be friends with them because these are the type of people that we need in our lives. We need surrounding ourselves. All right, so let's keep going. Verse 20 says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? 
But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on this earth to forgive sins. I love that Jesus was a little sassy here, and I love it. Because Jesus was like, excuse me, okay, I can't forgive sins. All right, I'm going to forgive his sins. And, come on, God, get up. Like, Jesus just lays it all out for him. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately, he stood up in front of them, took what he had been laying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen extraordinary things today. What I absolutely love about this is we don't know these people, and neither does a lot of the crowd. They saw these four guys. It says that they came from all over uh, Galilee, or yeah, Galilee, Judea, Jerusalem, everywhere they came. So most likely they did not know who these men were or who the paralyzed men were. They were just onlookers. They were there to see Jesus. And all of a sudden they see Jesus do this incredible thing and it impacted them in such an amazing way. Now for these men, they are the main characters in their lives and in their family and friends' lives. So it's kind of like if, uh, if you were to ask Kelly or my brother Trevor, tell me a story about Tiffany. They could, and they would tell you lots, probably not good ones. But I, because I am a main character in their lives, because I'm close to them. So when these men, when these friends and this paralyzed man went to their families and was telling them about what had happened and what had happened with Jesus, they could keep saying like, oh, my friend such and such did this. You know, they knew their names. But for everyone else in the crowd, these were just two guys or four or five guys who they were talking about and who they could say, man, let me tell you this cool thing that happened today. I don't know these guys, but let me just tell you about it. See, we are extras in a lot of people's stories. I'm not the extra in Kelly's. I'm not the extra in my parents, but I'm an extra in the story to the cashier at the grocery store that I have no idea. I'm an extra story to the homeless man on the street. I'm an extra in a story to the people at the movies or at the park or wherever. They don't know me. They don't know who I am. They just get a small glimpse of me when I interact with them on a day-to-day -day basis. And I want it to be where I live a life that my interaction is like, let me tell you about this extraordinary thing that happened to me today. This lady came through my line and she did this. I don't ever want to be, let me tell you what this person did today. Let me tell you how what they said to me on the phone or this and that when a telemarketer calls or when you're upset with a person at your doctor's office. I don't ever want to be a negative extra in somebody's story. How many times have you came home from somewhere and you're like, let me tell you what happened today. This person was in line at the grocery store and she tried to use her expired coupon and went all off on that cashier. I don't want to be that person. And we shouldn't be. When we are extras in someone's life, they get this small glimpse of not only us, they get a small glimpse of Jesus. And we don't want that glimpse of Jesus to be what not Jesus. We want them to see his power, his love, and his grace. So even if you're frustrated, if you're angry at something, they're like, man, I saw in the store today, someone, they were just, the cashier was wrong. They were going off. But man, that woman stood there with such grace and with such love and with such compassion, you would not believe. She didn't give in, she didn't kneel back. That's the kind of extra I wanna be in someone else's story. I don't wanna be, you know, the person who yells or the person who hates everybody. When I go to a restaurant, I don't want the waiters and the waitresses to be like, man, here comes Tiffany again. She doesn't tip worth nothing. She demands everything. I want them to see when I walk in, they're like, man, that one right there, she's from that church, Grace Point. And let me tell you, they are the best tippers when they come in here every Sunday. They're the ones who are showing us favor. They show us grace. They pray for us. They go out of their way to make sure that we are good and that they are showing Jesus's love. Because I don't want to represent myself, my family, my church, or especially Jesus in a way that is not his, his grace and his love. So this whole like verse right here, and then and the song like itself has so many different examples. It has, you know, the leper or the blind man with his mud on all these people that only get this small chunk in the Bible, but it made such an impact. This story of these five guys is 10 verses long. 17 through 26. That was their little picture in the Bible. I Googled it. There are 31,000 verses in the Bible. 31,000, and these guys take up 10. It seems so little, and yet it makes such an amazing and such a great impact on us. Because now, thousands of years later, here I am standing here talking about these guys who I don't even know their names, 
But I'm like, listen, these guys are such a great example of God's faith. They're such a great example of men who um, are just good friends, who love each other, who want to make sure that they are taking care of their buddy. Like, this is who we should be, these five nameless guys. And as important as Moses and Abraham and everybody else is, we can't overlook the extras. We can't overlook the extras in our lives, the people who show us grace, who show us mercy, who show us love, even though we may not deserve it and we may never know their names. We all have a story to tell. And sometimes our story is short, like these guys. And sometimes it's longer. Sometimes our story is one that we can get up and share. It's a, it's a main character, Moses, Abraham kind of story. And sometimes it's just this little glimpse. And sometimes that little glimpse of your story where there's no name, there's just nothing about it other than this is God's power. Let me tell you about God's power. Let me tell you about God's grace. Let me just show you in this small picture. So what I want you to do is when you came in, there should have been a piece of paper on your chair. Like I said, I'm a teacher, so we have a, an activity today. So on this little piece of paper, what I want you to do is I want you to write your story, but your story can only be one sentence. You cannot put your name on it. Your story in one sentence, who you are in Christ, what it shows. If you had this 10 verse little section and you needed it to make an impact in such an extraordinary way that people would talk about it for thousands of years later, how would you, what would you say, what would you do? So while you're doing that, there's another song, like I said, I'm all about some music. This one is called Good Feeling by Austin French. And it talks about just telling your story. So while it's playing, I want you to write down your one sentence story. And then I want you to bring it to the front and just put it on the steps. So remember, no names, no nothing, just your sentence about God's grace or your story in one sentence about God's grace.
<laughs> all right, all right. All right, so I'm going to read some of these to you guys. This is your story. This is your 10 verse pop in the Bible, but how you made an impact. It says, I'm a light to people who have a hard time and continue to love and help through the Lord. I am saved by the grace of God and healed by his miracles. Amen to that. God set me free from being stuck in darkness. I'm a big mess without God. Mm -hmm. I came from putting a needle in my arm and stealing to get money to know Jesus and trusting him with my life and drug free. Amen, amen. His whole life, oh, no way. Oh, choosing Jesus. Whole life was about one, one moment choosing Jesus. Sorry, it help if I could read. Uh, I was the one he ran after when I left the, when he left the 99. I absolutely love that song. That's so great. A great reminder of God's grace. I'm a delivered drug addict who has hope. Now these are our stories. These are the extra things that we want people to see. We want them to see that we are not the person we were in the past. We are the person that Jesus called us to be. We want them to see that whether we're the main character in our best friends or in our family's lives, or if we are that extra person at the grocery store or at Walmart or wherever we are, we want people to see God's love and God's grace. That when they look at us and when they find out we're a Christian and we're in church, they're all like, huh, really? We want them to be like, oh yeah, we knew that from day one. You've got this glow about you. You've got this joy that only Jesus can give you. Cause let me tell you right now that happiness is not from Jesus. Joy is from Jesus. A lot of things can make you happy, but to get that Jesus joy, that no matter what your life circumstances are, that you're still praising him, you're still singing songs, even when you're down and out and your people are like, what are you doing? Your life is a wreck. You're like, I know, but Jesus got it. I am good to go. That is the story that I want us to tell. That is the story that we should want to tell. We should want to be those people who are constantly calling out to him and be saying, God, what now? How can you show, how can I show your love and grace to my friends and to people around me, to people at the store, to people I don't know? How can I show your love and grace to strangers? Well, worship team, if I can go ahead, go ahead and have you guys come up. The last verse in this story so Luke 5, 26 says, everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen extraordinary things today. I want that to be said about those people around me. I want those people, people around me to say, man, we have seen extraordinary things. When they walk into my preschool classroom, I want them to be saying, man, this is an extraordinary classroom. Even sometimes this teacher is a hot mess and these kids are running around. There is something different in this room. There is Jesus. When I am on my way to work, I am praying for my kids. I am praying for the parents that no matter where they are in their lives, that they will get there safely. They'll bring their kids safely, that they will see God's grace in me. And sometimes when I'm praying, let me tell you, I have church in my car because this is not church. This right here is church. And when I'm in my car, sometimes I'll be getting it until I hit downtown and there's a lot of traffic. I'm like, whoo, bring it down, Jesus. We're going to get in a wreck. And you can't tell the officer, like, listen, I was praising and I got a little crazy. But sometimes we got to, I got to have that Jesus in my car on the way to work. I'm like, God, let them see you. Let my kids see you that even when I'm frustrated with them, even when they upset me, that all of these 17 little three-year-olds know that I love them and I care for them because you love and care for me. In your workplace, if some of you know, you may have a horrible boss or terrible co-workers, but they should be able to say, man, I don't know why that person is always respecting me or always showing me so much love and grace. And you say, let me tell you about my Jesus and how he showed me love and grace. We want to be able to tell these type of stories. So like I said earlier, this is when I preach and we get, it's one and done and we are quick because I feel like, I don't know, sometimes I just got too much Jesus in me and it's just coming out real quickly. So, but before we leave today, these guys are going to do this on joy that we did at the beginning because I am all about some joy. And I think whenever we leave this place, you should be so filled with joy that you can't contain it and that you've got to tell somebody because you're like, it's just spilling out, it's spilling over. And I just need to tell everybody about this Jesus joy. So I'm going to ask you guys to stand up and they are going to lead us in joy. And I want you to let loose. Eli, I want you to let loose, bud. I want you to do joy like you did on Wednesday night when it was just us in here. All my kiddos, all my youth, you, you ripped that accordion, Jonah. Like you, like we are going to leave in here. Nobody hold back. 
We're going to do some reckless abandoned worship, and we're just going to get it. Can we do that, church? Oh, that was so sad. I don't think we can. Can we do that? Yeah. There we go. All right. Take it away, Eli. much for bringing each and every person in here today. And I ask that, Father, as you are writing our story, that it, we will just stick with it, that we won't try to write our own. We will allow you to write it. So it is the perfect story that we can tell. I ask that you just continue just to have this joy that is filling us overflowing. So no matter who we see today, next week, next month, next year, that they will see your amazing love and your amazing joy. We love you today. We thank you. And everybody said... Amen. Y'all have an awesome week.